Hello, everybody. Welcome once again to another episode of the Remarkable Coach Podcast. As always, I am your host, Michael Pacheco. And today with me, I have Chuck Mahler. Chuck is founder and CEO of MCG Partners. He's also an executive coach advisor and the author of his old best-selling book, uh, the rise of the agile leader. Can you make the shift? Um, so you, if you're if you're watching this on YouTube, you saw us both chuckle right there. Uh, this is Chuck's second time on the podcast, and I'm using his bio from two years ago when the book was new, best new and best selling. Um, now it is old and best selling. <laughs> so amazing! Uh, it's it's old after two years, but yeah, it's well like that. <clears throat> comparatively yeah. anyway. Um, yes. Chuck, welcome back to The Remarkable Coach. Thanks, Michael. I'm really happy to be back. We had such a great conversation. And we we're, were just laughing before we went on air that it's been two years. I couldn't believe it. I thought it was like yeah. maybe maybe a year ago. But yeah, time flies. Right? Yeah, it was July, uh, July 2021. For those of you who want to go back, I encourage you to go back and check out uh, that first episode. Uh, Chuck goes uh, you know, into some, in, goes deep into, he talks about his book. Um, he talks about uh, balancing time, uh, executives time between strategy tactics and that sort of thing. And a number of other topics that I won't get into now, go back and listen to the old episode. It's all there. <laughs> uh, but Chuck, so, so for our listeners and viewers who have not had the opportunity uh, yet to go back and listen to that old episode, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself uh, who you are and what you do in your own words. Sure. Um, I appreciate that. So I started MCG Partners, got to be 16 years this June. Uh, time does go by fast, as we were just talking about a minute ago. Um, so I, I started it uh, because I'm, I'm passionate about the space. Right? We're, we're a leadership, organizational, and talent, you know, we'd like to call optimization firm. So it's really about um, how to, and our, and our big focus is really those three areas. So we're really kind of a full service boutique, boutique consulting firm. And in part of our leadership practice, I am also an executive coach. So I'm a practitioner in addition to being the CEO. Uh, my background is consulting. I've done everything from strategy consulting to change management. And then I got into the leadership development talent management space about 25 years ago. And I kind of got into building companies, building practices, mm -hmm. uh, always had that sort of entrepreneurial streak in me for big companies, small companies. And then um, I ran a, a mid-sized global consulting firm in this space. We got acquired twice in one year, and that's when I started MCG. So that's kind of my background. How does that work getting acquired twice in one year? Once you're well, acquired we're, once, aren't you just acquired and then it's done? Yeah, no, it, it happens. I mean, we're so my, my firm was acquired by a big competitor, yeah. Um, and we were owned by a holding company at the time. And so they acquired us and I did that integration. And then a, a really huge firm uh, that was not in our industry ended up buying uh, that firm. Gotcha. So literally that happened within 12 months, probably yeah. at, at 11, month 11 is when that acquisition happened. So I okay. got involved in two, two acquisitions in one year. Yeah. That must've been a hell of a roller coaster. <laughs> Yeah, and it's funny, anyone who's got this background, you know, I, I used to advise acquisitions and mergers, and now I've been through probably three or four, and remember one in particular, This these weren't that bad, the ones I just mentioned, but one a few, a lot years earlier, probably around 94, it was two big consulting firms, which I will not mention, probably the ugliest merger I've ever seen of any company. So it's amazing when you can advise how to Mer, just another one you have to go through it yourself, right? Uh -huh. um, sometimes people don't practice what they preach. I'll put it yeah. that way. Nice. Okay. Nice. Uh, well, I, I digress. Um, okay. Chuck, tell us, tell us what's 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 new with you. What's new in your life? What's new with MCG in the in the past? You know, a couple of years since we last spoke on this podcast. You know, it's interesting because, you know, as, as you know, and you mentioned, the book is now old, uh, relatively speaking. Uh, and I know I'm just, I'm just messing with you. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, the book is still actually really relevant. It, it surprises me in a positive way how many people still want to talk about the book, want to still read the book. Um, so it, everything in the book is really still very applicable in terms of, you know, we're still dealing with some of the same issues. Yes, maybe it was so intensified during COVID. Mm -hmm. I mean, COVID, you know, just was literally yesterday, but we're still dealing with some of the same issues. Um, you know, and I'll give you an example. One of the new things I'm involved in, 
I'm jumping the gun on, on, on this a little bit, is a CEO advisory group that I, I just created with a colleague of mine. We just, we just launched it. It's called LEAD, L-E-A-D. So, you know, very clever, right? It's a, it's, it's a CEO <laughs> advisory group. And it's really geared toward about 400 CEOs in Greater Boston, where we're going to meet, you know, once a quarter, share best practices, have a CEO guest speaker. It's a private group. It's only CEOs only. There's no financial investment. So it's, it's really, a, it's, it's complementary to CEOs. So it's a very different model than what's out there. Mm -hmm. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because, you know, as, as I look at all the research that's out there, whether it's McKenzie, whether it's Gallup, whether it, it's other sources, some of the same issues that we were dealing with the last several years are still top of mind. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's maybe some new additional things like obviously like the economy and inflation, mm -hmm. but this whole notion of war for talent in terms of how do we retain, how do we develop? And then that really ties into how do we make sure this hybrid or virtual workforce works? Mm -hmm. And this whole debate, do we even want to have a hybrid or virtual workforce? So some of the same issues that were really relevant a couple of years ago because it was so new at the time are really still focused today. Mm hmm I like that. What What are your? I'm just out of curiosity. Um, since we're here, since we're chatting about stuff, sure. what are your thoughts on the workplace in 2023? Yeah, I I I, I think obviously you know, one of the things that's probably the hottest topic, and I and I have to say honestly, I still have enough time to really dive into it from a research standpoint. But artificial intelligence, right? AI, mm -hmm. AI is really slowly starting to creep into. Uh, the workforce and some of the tools and software that's out there. Mm -hmm. So I really don't want to get into it because I don't really have a position yet on it. Sure. I think that's something that probably six months from now, if, if you want to chat about it or a year from now, it'll probably be more of a robust conversation because it's actually moving fast, moving faster than I think people realize and how there are platforms out there in software that impacts how companies are doing business, whether it's in sales, whether it's in marketing, branding, um, customer uh, support, it, it's impacting you know, a variety of pieces of the business, but we're just, we're just at that really entry level there. So that's, that's the newest thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think that, um, you know, I think my position is, you know, you know, they're, they're, they're one of the biggest debates and we're going to actually, that's our first topic in a couple of weeks with the CEO group in Boston, we're going to be talking about, we're having a CEO present on this and I'm going to share best practices on this, mm -hmm. but it's this debate of do we want people back in the office? And, you know, there are a lot of CEOs out there. We've been reading about it now the last few months. They're really pushing people to get back in the office. But there's a challenge with that, and several challenges. One, Michael, is that people we have like a shortage from home. of laborers. Sorry? I think because people like working from home. That too, yes. <laughs> you know, four out of five workers in this country want to work, want flexibility. Yeah. And they want, I'm not saying they want complete virtual, but they want minimal hybrid. Yeah. And, and, and whether it's because they've settled now on new childcare, uh, new co-parenting, mm -hmm. depending on your parental relationship and, you know, assuming most people are working as couples today, um, there's all kinds of complexities in terms of people's personal preferences, in terms of their lifestyle, which also is impacting, you know, how they want to work. Mm -hmm. um, companies are still lagging behind, both from a technology standpoint, even that's probably caught up faster than the latter, which is management effectiveness. Most companies have not done a good enough job of, of investing in managing effectiveness and developing their managers to be effective in managing a, a hybrid or virtual workforce. Mm -hmm. And you're just not going to wake up one day and be good at that. You're just right. not. And you've got to also be much, you have to be really aware of your natural biases of managing people virtually or hybrid versus an office. And there are some. Um, but I think that the biggest challenge there, because I think logically most people would say, yes, I see the value of all of us being in the same office. But if you're going to be a national or global company and have a workforce and tapping to talent, when we literally have a skilled labor shortage, not only in this country, but around the world, mm -hmm. you almost don't have a choice but to think about expanding your ability to hire top talent. If you're going to limit your hiring capability because you want everybody in an office, you just shrank your hiring pool by probably 95%. Mm -hmm. So I think the reality of that sort of disconnect is al already happening. Now, there's some companies out, th out there like investment bankers are a good example where it's like, look, you know, you want to come here, you know, 
you don't have to work for us. We're very picky who we're going to hire. You're going to make a lot of money. We're picking the, the best of the best. That's probably one of the few exceptions. But for everybody else, guess what? The reality is if you, if you want to have a strong workforce, top talent, you're going to have to be flexible in terms of hiring people. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting one, man. And I've, I've got, I've got my own opinions on it and I'll, I'll share a little bit about that if that's all right. Yeah, please. I don't think, you know, nobody works in a silo and a lot of knowledge work done these days is in, in some way, shape or form creative work. And especially as someone who, you know, owns a creative agency, um, I think I, I, I am under the impression that highly creative work is better when people are in the same room. I just, I, 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 I've seen that in my own experience, right? This is a, an N equals one experiment. <laughs> um, but you know, it's like, it's like taking, you know, five members of a band and putting them around the world and trying to write an album that way. And bands have done that before and they've done it successfully. And there's so many challenges to that process, not being in the same room and not having that energy, that chemistry, that kind of, you know, um, that thing that you can't quite put your finger on that, 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 that is, is a big part of creative work. What do you think about that? I mean, look, I, I see a lot of benefits uh, of being in office. I, I, you know, if I had a choice, I would go that way. I mean, yeah. there are definitely benefits. I mean, without getting into all this, but there's literally um, uh, physical chemistry that connects how people connect together when they're in the same room. Right. Um, and I'm not talking about just physical attraction. I'm just talking about energy and connection mm -hmm. and how that stimulates people creatively in, in, in terms of their, their brain and their activities and their energy and their, and their ability to think and process, you just can't get those, those same advantages when you're always virtual. However, as you and I, you know, I, I went hundred percent virtual during COVID, right? So all my people are virtual, but to your point, I find creative ways for us to get together in yep. person. Yep. Uh, it, it is harder. You have to work harder to develop relationships, to establish trust, to get to know people when you're virtual. But I, you know, I think the safer option is hybrid where people mm -hmm. are getting together in person on a regular basis. And it, it doesn't have to be even every week, but if you can at least get people together and find that connection and have a conversation, it's a really hard when you're doing it virtually, there's huge advantages. Mm -hmm. But I also think we have to deal with the practical reality of, again, the, 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 the labor pool that's available. And it depends on your business. It depends on your industry. It depends on your size too, Michael. Yeah. So I think there's some factors. But my, I think my point is, if you want to be more competitive and, and, and obviously expanding as a larger firm, you have to make sure that if you're going to be hybrid, if you're going to be virtual, do it the right way. Get good at it. Mm -hmm. Really invest in the ability to create culture. It's harder to have culture um, you know, virtually and hybrid versus in office. It just is. And that's one of the bigger issues with CEOs today. They're very concerned about that, and they should be. But guess what? It can be done. It's just harder, but you have to do things differently. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I want to be clear, I'm, I'm coming at this not as a, you know, not as a, as a Luddite who thinks everyone should be, you know, chained to a desk in the same office. Um, my right. entire team is remote. You know, I've got the, 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 the nearest employee to me is about an hour's drive away. The furthest employee from me uh, is, lives in Pakistan. Right. Okay. <laughs> You know, so it's like, so, so we're, we're definitely a distributed team over the, across the world. I think, you know, what I would like to do, I think for my team, at least, and we're a, we're a small team of, you know, five people, um, is maybe do like a retreat, you know, once or twice a year yep. and have everyone meet somewhere fun. I think that goes a long way. I, yeah. I, I would encourage anybody in any business, no matter what your big business is or how big or small you are, find, even if your people like you are scattered around the globe, around you know North America, find ways to get together. There's mm -hmm. nothing that's going to duplicate getting together and, and forming that bond and forming that connection and forming that level of trust and openness and understanding. It's yeah. really hard to do that virtually. It just is. Now, again, people are doing it. But as we just said, there are huge advantages when you get together in person. Mm -hmm. But 
you know, when you're limited to do that, even if you are doing that, really, really get good at working virtually and hybrid. And I think not enough companies have really put enough energy in that. I, I, I just don't think they have. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Nice. I think we're on the, on the same page there. Um, I agree. Chuck, your, your, your first book, uh, the rise of the agile leader, first book, not the old book. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a second book uh, or a new book in the making anytime soon? Um, you know, I, I am thinking about a new book. Um, I'm not ready, ready to write it yet, but, mm-hmm. um, I do have a book. It's probably going to be uh, more of a thought-provoking individual effectiveness. I mean, there's a lot of that kind of self-help. I'm not really sure it's going to be a self-help book, but it's going to really be more, I think, individually focused. Mm-hmm. Um, um, but I haven't. I, I'm still. I'm still in the creative uh, concept stage. Still, still percolating. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a couple of title. You laugh. You know, I'm starting with a title, but the reason is because the title is going to it gives me the focus of what what the concept of the book is going to be. Mm-hmm. So I have a couple, I have a couple of really good, good thoughts and things I can really write about. And, 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 you know, not only my own personal experiences, but a lot of things I've done in my career now, which is almost 40 years. So, um, yeah, so there's some, so yes, a second book is coming. It's probably nice. going to be, it's probably about a year off. Okay. That's great. That's great. You'll have to, uh, you'll have to let me know when that comes out. And we'll get you, we'll get you back on here for round three. I appreciate that. I will. Yeah, you bet. Um, is there anything else that's, that's new in, in your world or in the world of MCG lately? Yeah, I, I would say, well, one thing I did do, which I had not done yet, which is I did, um, do my audio book. So, okay, cool. um, I, I am the, I am the, I am the voice of my audio book. So I know that a lot of people out there that don't like to read books because they're busy and they like to listen to books when they're traveling or when they're commuting or when they have some downtime. So for those other like audio books, I did record and, uh, produce uh, and publish my audio book. Um, I think, I think it came out right before the holidays. So that that's done. Um, and the other thing I would say, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. I was just not. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's kind of new. Um, the other thing that I would say that it's really not necessarily new, but it's again, it's been pretty hot now for about two years and we're still talking about it. And there's two things I would add. Uh, the second thing would be culture. I mentioned this a second ago, mm-hmm. but I cannot tell you how many conversations, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm having with companies, especially CEOs around culture. Not only what culture is, what it means for them, but how to really, how to frame it and how, how, how to have a, a framework they can actually practically utilize and implement for their company and do that in an effective way. So I've been doing a lot more work around culture. I actually have another uh, CEO meeting in June with about 50 CEOs and uh, in, 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 uh, uh, in healthcare to talk mm-hmm. about culture and walk them through a framework and a roadmap and a methodology that I created. Actually, it's in the book, but remember, culture is a very small piece of the book. Yeah. And now I'm going, I'm getting much deeper, not only at the strategic level, but at the practical sort of framework level. So that's actually also new. And then again, well, this think- is, I'm sorry. I think, I think right there, I think we've got an idea for book number three. <laughs> <laughs> that could be a good uh, number three book. Um, Deep dive into culture. Yeah, I think, I think that's always going to be relevant, especially as I think, I think when you think about, you know, the future of artificial intelligence, hybrid, virtual, global workforce, uh, the changes of industry, continue, the cycles of change continue to get shorter and shorter. Yeah. Culture is going to be that sort of foundation, I think, that companies are going to really have to focus on. So I think that's a really good point. The other, and again, it's not a new concept, but one thing that continues to, to happen is that the turnover at the executive level is amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we're still seeing huge turnover uh, within executive teams of all levels, not just the C team. And, and the reason I'm bringing this up because how do you create high-performing, good decision-making leadership teams when there's constant change in them, people are coming and going? So we, we, we as an organization, as a company, and I'm involved in this as well, we're really working with a lot of executive teams, putting them through programs to really accelerate them becoming a strong, trusting, high-performing, decision-making team. So I would say those have kind of been the big themes the last, the last year or so. I like that. I think that that echoes a lot of what I've been hearing as well. Um, 
not as much with the churn of executive staff, but definitely I've been hearing a lot of echoes throughout the leadership and executive coaching sphere on culture. Culture has, mm -hmm. has become huge. And I, and I suspect a large part of that is this new, you know, this new approach to the office that we have that we've never right. really, never really had before. Um, for you and you, with your clients, with your coaching, where do you, where do you start um, with that? I don't, you don't, I don't, you don't need to walk through your entire framework, but if you could give us kind of an overview of what some of that coaching looks like um, coming from you in terms of, you know, how to, how to establish a foundation and then develop culture in a company with right. a hybrid or remote work workspace. Yeah. I mean, and no surprise when I say this, right. But uh, you know, when you start talking about uh, framework and, and uh, culture, it's as much consulting and advisory work as it is, you know, coaching, because coaching definitely is an element of it. Sure. But, um, you know, that's where you start getting to the implementation of it and how, how do you sustain that? Yeah. Um, but to kind of give you some of the insight of that, I, you have to start with defining what you mean by culture. Mm -hmm. and, and it's such a sort of, um, it, it's a term that's been around for a long time. It's not new. Clearly, as we already said, that because of COVID, it really sort of became top of mind because of how the workforce changed overnight. Yeah. Um, even that in itself was not new, but we all went hybrid or, or we actually we all went virtual initially, then became hybrid and now back in office, depending on where you are. But uh, yeah, so, so what, what do you mean by culture? What, and you know, so defining what you mean by culture is really critical. The first place I always start, which I'll share with everybody here, is you have to really identify uh, what really is, and depending on what your business is, what, what's, your, what's your mission, what's your vision, What's your what's your values? What you stand for? Essentially, like this tie, and this ties into, by the way, what you do for a living. By the way, Michael, very yeah. much so. Because I always talk about your external brand and your internal brand. Mm -hmm. There's got to be alignment there, mm -hmm. right? So when you're when you're trying to say, why do you want my consumers or my buyers, you know, to buy my products and services? Um, you know, why? What's my value proposition? That should be aligned with why do I want to work here? Mm -hmm. What's the experience I'm going to have here? What's mm -hmm. my career going to look like? Um, you know, what, what's my overall experience in terms of how, I, you know, how I'm going to be appreciated and valued and learn and grow as an employee? So, you know, even though there's been work in the talent acquisition space in this area a little bit, it hasn't gotten into the broader context for most companies into what we mean by culture. Mm -hmm. And essentially, culture should be a reflection of what your values are. And those values are a reflection of your external internal brand. So that's where we always start. Yeah, I love that. More than more than a mission statement or a vision statement, I always like to think about culture as as the you know the company values and not company values in the flowery sense of the word, right? right. That where we're we're posturing and we're we're talking about. Um, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, values that we, uh, aspirational values, right? Yes. Not talking about that. I'm talking about values that you're willing to hire by, values that you're willing to fire by, right? If someone's not meeting those values, it's it, maybe it's time to let them go. Like values that actually mean something to the company and the people within the company. And I think that, um, anyways, that's how I like to think about about yeah, it. well, you're 100 right, and, and the biggest problem, and, and I hate to say it, it hasn't changed much in many, many years. Companies go through this exercise of identifying their values. And to your point, uh -huh. and, and by the way, they can be aspirational in the sense that you're always trying to aspire to get there, mm -hmm. but it doesn't doesn't mean that you shouldn't still be living them, right? Mm -hmm. They have to be practical in the sense that they're identifiable, and they actually can be, you know, I, you know, observable. And, and used to not only hire, but to manage, to advance, to promote, to reward, to recognize, and yes, also to exit. Mm -hmm. And that's the big mess because mm -hmm. most companies go through this big exercise of identifying values and they create these internal marketing strategies to, to celebrate that. Mm -hmm. And that's why you have all these poster boards and cafeterias and conference rooms and these little pop-ups sitting on tables. And then <laughs> dust starts to collect because they don't, they don't take that concept yeah. and actually you know, create a systemic process to incorporate that into their day to day.
Mm-hmm. And then and then they don't they don't walk it. Then you got people, usually top performers, who don't demonstrate those values, but are still yeah. there and celebrated and rewarded and recognized. So people then say, okay, well, your values don't really reflect who you are, and why should I work here? And then and then you know, so so your your values and your culture, but by the way, are completely aligned with engagement, employee engagement, performance, uh, retention of top talent. And frankly, financial overall financial points. So there's a whole correlation to all this. Mm-hmm. So it, believe it or not, it's actually really critical work. Yeah. It's not just a fun exercise because we want to do some fun stuff to say, hey, why do you want to work here? It really comes down to a critical core competency of who you are as an organization and how each employee of all levels internalize that, understands what it means, how to, how to demonstrate that, mm-hmm. and how to actually hold it as an organization everyone accountable to that. No, 100% agree with you there, Chuck. And I, and I want to be clear, you know, I'm not against aspirational values, but what I am against is is exactly what you're talking about. A bunch of values that sound really great in a conference room, up on the whiteboard, on paper, and that nobody gives a shit about. Pardon my French. <laughs> well, no one gives a shit about it because no one, no one, no one knows what anything's being done about it. It's like, right. that's great. It sounds nice. Yeah. What does that mean to me? Yeah. What does that mean to us as an organization? Right. Are we are we being hired off of it? Are we being developed off of it? Are we be or getting promoted off of it? Yeah. Is it part of our performance review process? Am I getting developed off of it? So that's the disconnect. Most companies go through this exercise and it sits in a silo. Nothing does. Nothing gets done with it. And then even worse, people start demonstrating the opposite of those values, and it's accepted, and nothing 100%. happens. Yeah. And then people say, "Well, why would I want to work here?" No, to 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 your point, Chuck. The everybody, everybody in the company, everybody on the team, from the CEO to the intern, should be. And your word was internalizing that, and 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 really, you know, it, you know, not living up to it perfectly, per se, necessarily, right? But internalizing it and feeling it and 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 being doing the best that they can right to to live out those values yeah and and think about it this way in the competitive world that we're in not just for buying products and services and surviving as a business but in this getting the best people to work at my firm and retaining that top talent and even though with with the economy the way it's been the last few months and the turnover and the layoffs and restructuring guess what companies are still desperate to hire people unemployment percentages are still overall very low. Mm-hmm. And, and why? Because we, as we were talking about earlier, we have this shortage of skilled labor. Mm-hmm. And so if you want to be a high performing organization with top talent, you know, culture is a foundation for your success as a business. It's not just some nice thing to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so it's, it's really become, and, 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 you know, and I, the good news is it's really one of the top issues that CEOs are looking at right now. They're really focused on culture because they understand the connection to financial performance, employee engagement, and their and their internal external brand and who they are as an organization. Why you want to buy for, buy us as you know buy our services and products, and why you want to work for us. Yeah. So it's being able to connect all those dots. But then it's about how do I implement this? How do right. I how do I make this a practical thing that's embedded into my systems and processes of the organization? And that is the key step. Mm-hmm. And I suppose the the first step in that is, again, like these values that you're creating, it's not just something that goes into a, you know, a company notebook, and then it just, you know, dies in a in a dusty drawer for the rest of its life. But it's something that you are considering when you're hiring people. It's something that you're considering as you do quarterly reviews for employees. Um, it's It's something that you consider at all times because it is the it becomes the culture of the company to do so yeah that, that's that's essentially what why, why we're here yeah. and, and it's not about it's not about pointing fingers on a person that doesn't demonstrate all the values it's about how to use that as a framework to say what do you you know one yes you need to know that you're not demonstrating these values and here are the examples are how you're not here's yeah. what it should look like and by the way how can we help you and how can we develop you to make sure that you understand that they have more self-awareness 
And this is where the coaching can come in, you know, how you train managers to coach through this yep. um, so they can actually work with employees and managers managing other managers mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that everyone's held it. You know, they understand what those expectations are. So, yes, it has to be embedded into your performance management system and processes, as well as recognition, reward, advancement, hiring. So that's why when I talked about you know, internalizing it. Uh, in, in terms of your organization, as well as individually, because you need to understand that, that's where feedback is important. That's where managers have to give feedback to people to say, hey, you know, here's what we're doing a great job of demonstrating these values and here's where we can get better at it. Mm -hmm. So that, that's how it's, it ha there's got to be processes and systems throughout your organization and how you live these values, how you celebrate those values and how to make sure that as a brand internally, but also externally, your customers know who you are as an organization, what your brand is, because your culture essentially is your brand. It should be at least. 100%. Yeah. yeah. This is great, Chuck. I, I, I apologize if I derailed the train and, and oh. took us down specifically the culture path, but it's one that I think it, it, it fascinates me um, as, you know, as someone who, uh, I just don't want to feel like I'm working every day, like I'm going to work every day, right? I like to enjoy myself. And part of that for, for me and my company, um, is, is that we do have a great culture. And when we get together, there's, you know, generally a lot of laughter and joking around, um, that happens because that's, what's important for us. Right. And, and, and it's the, the, the culture thing again, is it also a, kind of a, seems like a hot button topic in the past year or so. And, and by the way, it ties into everything we just talked about earlier, because part of culture is what do you value as a place to work at? And that yeah. includes not only lifestyle. And do, am I invested as a company to you as a person in your personal life and your family life? And, and, and by the way, your preference in terms of how you want to work, mm -hmm. including in office, hybrid and virtual. So it's not just about demonstrating values. It's also about how do we value as a person? Mm -hmm. uh, that's part of that, that culture. And so it's, it's a big conversation. It's a big, it's a big, it's a big need for companies to get real great clarity on what they mean by that. And why, frankly, again, it's so critical. And yes, you can make decisions like, okay, we're going to be only in office, but then you have to understand and recognize what that means for you as a business and in right. terms of attracting people. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Nice, Chuck. Um, listen, man, uh, is there anything else that you would like to talk about that we haven't touched upon? No, those are those are the big things that you asked. Um, you know, I'm happy we're able to, to discuss at least went a little deeper dive than the rest, but uh, no, it's uh, appreciate the conversation. It's great to catch up and have you all by me saying congratulations. And I know she's not a baby anymore, but having a daughter, because again, it's new to me. <laughs> I didn't, we haven't talked in two years. So you've got a 14 month old daughter, which is amazing. Yeah, uh, no, I appreciate congratulations it. Congratulations on that. She's, she's fantastic. I'll, I'll, I'll do the, uh, I'll do the obligatory picture again for those watching the show on YouTube. <laughs> there's, there's my, my wife and my baby girl, Opal. Beautiful. And she's, uh, she, I mean, she's amazing, man. She's amazing. First time dad. So uh, I get the, awesome. I get the butterflies when I talk about her. <laughs> awesome stuff, Michael. It really is. Um, Chuck, this has been a pleasure catching up, man. Um, where can people connect with you online? Um, and if you've got, uh, you know, any, if you've got anything to, to pitch, man, now's the time. Go for it. The, the, the floor is yours. <laughs> Well, again, people can always reach me. Uh, LinkedIn is probably the easiest thing to do. Uh, just find my name, Chuck Moeller, M-O-L-L-O-R. Uh, my company website is mcgpartners.com. I also have my individual website, which is based on the book, which is chuckmoeller.com. Those are the best ways to reach me. Um, you know, and I think I've already kind of pitched everything that we're talking about working on, so I, I'm good to go. But thank you, Michael, for the opportunity. And, and great to reconnect. Let's keep awesome. on doing it. Beauty. Thank you so much, Chuck. Uh, for making the time to chat with me today. Thank you to our viewers and listeners. You guys are fantastic. And we will see y'all next time.